Uh, okay, so let me let me start then. Um, hello and welcome to the discussion Taxes and the Age of Fintech, exploring the case studies. It is my pleasure to be a host of this event and to get with you and today's guests, uh, we'll dive deep into GovTech and Fintech partnerships. Fintech sector within the past decade dragged a special attention for its rapid development, constant innovation, and its ambition to build cross-border and the cashless society. At the same time, governments across the world are dealing with various old and new challenges that are related with uh, financial sector, such as shadow economy, digitalization and automation of services, changing regulations, as well changing the needs of the citizens. Solutions that worked 10 years ago are no longer applicable today. That's why innovation becomes a common interest point for government organizations, banks, fintechs, businesses, and startup community to join forces and to rethink public services and create impact together. So during today's event, uh, we will learn from some of the best uh, case studies and success stories from Lithuania, Estonia, Hungary, Finland, and Luxembourg, and see what challenges are they successfully coping with uh, from the tax perspective. Um, about today's event, uh, I will introduce our guests of today one by one and we'll ask them to showcase uh, their solutions. Afterwards, we will have um, a panel discussion to hear the key takeaways from them. So please stay till the end and enjoy the event. So to kick off, I would like to invite uh, Henry Lindeberg, Development Specialist at Estonian Tax and Customs Board. Uh, he will tell us more about uh, payroll tax collection uh, related to salary payment. Uh, hello, Henry. Hello. Um, okay, I will share my screen. I hope everyone can see my my slides. So uh, yes, hello. I'm Henry Indeberg, a development specialist in uh, Estonian Tax and Customs Board, and uh, uh, I will uh, give a brief uh, overview of uh, one of our uh, solutions that uh, we have uh, created uh, in cooperation with the uh, LHV bank uh, to collect uh, uh, payroll tax declarations uh, from businesses uh, in as a background service basically so uh, we we have different ways to declare uh, our uh, payroll taxes uh, these are of course, still paper forms, which are not very uh, used anymore. Electric forms uh, in uh, our EMTA, which is uh, our Estonian Customs uh, Tax and Customs Force online self-service portal. Uh, then, of course, there is a way to uh, upload a predefined file format uh, if uh, anyone uh, uses uh, these from uh, from uh, accounting softwares, for example. Then there is a direct data transfer from uh, from accounting softwares, uh, which uh, is very widely used. And then finally, uh, we started to think about a little bit more of innovation and uh, thought about how to take it to a real time tax declarations, which means uh, basically you are declaring uh, taxes without thinking about uh, uh, about filling and confirming your uh, payroll tax declarations. So this is done uh, in a back, as a background process while you are actually paying out your salaries to your employees. So how does it, what is it? It is an innovative uh, payment solution uh, set up in cooperation with bank and uh, Estonian Tax and Customs Board. And it is mainly for small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, and uh, that uh, solution enables for those uh, companies uh, or enterprises to pay out uh, salaries to their employees and declare state taxes in a single channel at the same time, which is convenient uh, to uh, uh, pre-fill uh, the uh, declarations uh, of 
income and social tax returns and uh, it is automatically done in the background so you don't have to think about it so why did we do it so we thought we uh, looked at uh, at uh, the small and medium sized enterprises in Estonia who only pay payroll taxes and there was about uh, 38000 of those companies and uh, that is about one third of the employers uh, in Estonia so our objective was to uh, reduce the administrative burden of these uh, small and medium sized enterprises and uh, and uh, we thought about what we actually needed. Did we need uh, the data on the tax returns or the tax returns themselves? So, of course, we needed data to calculate tax and collect it. Collect it. And uh, we uh, analyzed where we could get this data. The most uh, logical place was a bank where these uh, payments are done. So. This is how we came up with this solution. So who is it for? It's mainly for uh, small and medium sized enterprises uh, who are not VAT liable because VAT tax declarations are not uh, done through this uh, solution. And uh, companies or businesses who use mostly uh, the six main common payment types uh, so these are salary payments, dividends, management board member fees, uh, sickness benefits, uh, payments uh, of uh, contract uh, under the law of obligation, and uh, also uh, minimum social tax obligations. Uh, so the minimum social tax is paid for the for your employees. For example, in cases where where the employee was uh, mostly uh, on uh, vacation for the majority of the month, so you still need to pay the minimum social tax obligations for for them. Uh, then I will show you the user experience how it looks like. So we uh, developed it uh, with uh, in cooperation with LHG Bank. So we have worked with. Uh, Margus uh, on these uh, services before and uh, in order to make the payments the representative of the company must have signed agreement with the bank to use the service uh, and full authorization to approve payments in the internet bank and on uh, Estonian tax and customs board size, side they need to have the authorized access to the EMTA self-service portal to uh, to represent this company. So uh, the accountant, for example, has to have the uh, uh, the right uh, uh, permissions in both sides, in the bank side and also in the tax and customs board side. Side. Then um, uh, they have second. Uh, they basically have to. Uh, log into their uh, internet bank, uh, start a new payment, they select the uh, payment type as salary payment and uh, fill in all the necessary fields. So this is very similar to a regular bank transfer, but uh, here you have a couple of more fields to fill in, which uh, are necessary to fill in the tax declarations in the background. So. There are also employer employees uh, identification code, for example. They have to select the payment type, is it salary or dividend payments. Uh, then uh, also uh, we have a working rate, time rate, which uh, has to be filled in. And, and uh, the net amount of uh, payment to, uh, to the employee. And uh, on the background, yes, I, I talked about those so the uh, amount paid out to the employee and uh, then on the background as you filled in these uh, amounts and all the data uh, the background process uh, calculates the taxes and the taxes are calculated on uh, on uh, tax administration side not on the bank side so we have a communication uh, services between uh, two institutions or two two parties and uh, the 
tax calculator is always correct because it is done by uh, tax administration. So next, uh, if that was all correct, uh, you have to sign the, and approve the payment and it is done. So the payment to the employee is done, tax return is filled with the payment data and tax is paid also on the background. So in, uh, in one uh, transaction, you paid out uh, the salary or the payment to the employee and also a second transfer in the background is done to uh, tax administration for the taxes. So a little bit about the technical details also, uh, how, it, how this solution works. It is based on uh, uh, two XROAD-based services, data exchange services, which uh, XROAD is a data exchange uh, layer that is uh, used in uh, Estonia between different government organizations. Uh, service one is tax calculation that uh, was used in, uh, in the background while to calculate the taxes and the uh, second service is the one that uh, uh, fills in the tax return or tax declaration in uh, tax administration side and confirms it when uh, the time is correct. So those services are running in background. Taxpayer only sees a calculated tax amount in uh, Internet Bank and uh, doesn't have to worry about anything else. Uh, also, if a bank wants to start providing this service, then they have to uh, uh, sign a data exchange agreement between bank and uh, Estonian Tax and Customs Board. So this is also necessary to, to secure the data exchange between uh, about uh, the, uh, the employees between two uh, parties. So the background processes work like this. All required salary, salary payment uh, form fields are filled in Internet Bank. Uh, service one checks the uh, uh, if all the permissions are uh, present and then calculates the tax. Second uh, step is uh, confirming the payment. Uh, service two also double checks the permissions and uh, authorization uh, in Estonian Tax and Customs Board side. Uh, then if uh, that is all correct and uh, fine, then it fills in the tax returns and uh, the payment uh, with the payment data. Uh, bank makes payment to employee and also the second payment uh, about taxes to Estonian Tax and Customs Board. And uh, this uh, third step is on the background. Customs Board automatically checks if their return has any mistakes, uh, just to double check it. If uh, there are some mistakes uh, for whatever reason, then uh, we send out a notification to the employer, uh, email or SMS, uh, that they have to come to uh, our EMTA self-service uh, portal and uh, check the uh, declaration there might be something wrong. In uh, most cases, everything is correct and the tax declaration is automatically confirmed and uh, this everything is done. So uh, nothing else to worry about. And uh, that's it from my side. Um solution to be presented is from Hungary and it is Attila Mijani, Head of Central Management Control Department at National Tax and Customs Administration. She will tell us the presentation, the end of the shadow economy, online invoices and online cash registers. Hi all, my name is Attila and I would like to introduce you uh, to interesting project in Hungarian Tax Administration, the online invoicing and online cash registers. At first of all, I would like to remark that the title of that presentation is given by the organizers. I changed in a very, very minor part the title. I added a question mark uh, to the, after the first sentence. Let's see the uh, details of two projects after 
defining some principles. So, a good data reporting system has to be immediate, automatic and detailed. That's important to get immediately, automatically detailed data for the tax administration, which is already a safe place. Both the online cash registers and online invoice reporting follow that three principles. Online cash registers. The spirit of that system is the fiscal control unit, which is as obligatory part of online cash of, of the new cash registers in Hungary. The fiscal control unit is recording, storing and transmitting the data to the tax administration. Uh, what kind of data? All the data of cash register printed documents, so the receipt. And it is a well-defined data structure and it's general instruction how to create that XML file. So, independently of manufacturer, all the cash registers use the same XML structure for the data reporting. Uh, the fiscal unit stores the ev some event uh, data and uh, daily technical report and it is logging the communication with the server. The log file is a standard XML file independently of the manufacturer. The communication in online cash register system uh, done on mobile phone network. The mobile phone coverage in Hungary uh, is, is uh, near 200%. It was already in uh, 2013 when introduction of the, that uh, online cash register system started. So the mobile phone network is a very safe and available, always available uh, infrastructure for that for the online cash registers communication. Here's the overview of the system we provide an integration and test access for supporting the developers. Here are the cash registers sending data via mobile phone network and we store the collected data in a data warehouse and we have a special tool for a local inspection support uh, activity. To it's very interesting part of the system that the tax administration can remotely update the, some details in the fiscal control unit. We can update the header receipt. And finally, that's the most important uh, part of the system. The tax administration can update the fiscal control unit firmware. And it's the only way to change that uh, firmware. Milestones of the introduction, as you see, it was about a two year process from the first legislation until the deadline for changing to online. Uh, that's a very, very tight schedule. So most of other countries are uh, following uh, uh, not, not so strange schedule. The online cash register system is very successful project. It was very successful project if we decrease the VAT gap before the introduction and after the introduction, it, uh, it uh, uh, decreased with about 7% percentage point. The online invoice reporting came about five years later. Uh, that's an obligation. All the invoices has to be reported to the tax administration and the introduction has 
three uh, milestones, three steps. At first, from uh, July 2018, only the B2B uh, invoices are to report it when the VAT content is over a defined limit. From July this, this year, with no limit, all the B2B invoices uh, are to report. And from next year, January, all the issued invoices, the B2B, B2C, and, and uh, so all, all the invoices are to be reported. How to do it? The machine-made invoices uh, has to be reported uh, immediately using, using uh, uh, a REST API. And the handmade invoices, uh, there is a web portal to report them. It has to be done in one to five days after issuing the uh, invoice. What kind of data? All the VAT related data has to be reported. So that reporting uh, obligation follows the three principles too. It is automatic, just in uh, machine-made invoices. It is detailed, and it has to be automatic. There is an online invoice portal for uh, the details of that uh, online invoice reporting. All necessary data is available, and it's uh, available in English too. All the description, all the definitions, of the system. Technically, it's a machine-to-machine. The machine-to-machine -machine data, uh, data report uh, use just common technologies, and it made on the public internet. And uh, it used just very common and uh, uh, and free technologies, so all the developers can prepare the invoicing softwares for making that uh, online report about on, uh, issuing the, uh, the invoices. The Hungarian Tax Administration provide uh, an invoicing software, an online invoicing solution for the very small taxpayers. It's a service. It's not necessary to use. It's just a, a service, which is uh, a, a, a basic solution for small payers, for taxpayers. So finally, uh, that two solutions. Uh, I don't know if they are the and the, of of the shadow economy, but uh, but I hope so. So I hope we can ignore the question mark from the title of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's uh, move on with um, our. Next speaker, uh, it is Marcus Holland. He is uh, the head of digital banking at LHB Bank Estonia. And Marcus will tell us what happens when fintech meets freelancing and uh, will explain what is entrepreneur account. Hi, everyone. Uh, as pointed out, my name is Marcus, and I will, will try to explain what we did with something called the entrepreneur account. Let's see if we can get this. Um, uh, keynote to start. One second. Let's see. <clears throat> Hopefully the uh, thing will now show. Now, um, why and uh, why did we actually do this and, and who's it for? The entrepreneur account is um, simply, it's just a simple bank account. And um, it is for private persons. And uh, it's for, used for, um, let's say, all the uh, simple person-to-person -person transactions that 
might uh, that actually require that you declare your taxes. So far, mostly people uh, have not used this, but uh, because something like this did not exist, if you were a really law-abiding citizen, uh, you actually did uh, declare your taxes uh, when when the time was right. But let's be honest, most people usually didn't. Now we have this really simple solutions for let's say babysitters, handy workers, market vendors, uh, whoever needs to or does transactions with uh, other people and uh, mainly where cash is involved. Uh, entrepreneur account also can be used for uh, person to business transactions, but there is a slight difference uh, that if you are actually selling products, uh, it's perfect. Uh, it, if you're making self-made, uh, I don't know, you're making, you're knitting uh, something or, or something that actually has very small expenses, this is the perfect solutions. solutions. But if you are providing a service, uh, then this might not be the best case for you or the best solutions be, uh, solution because um, uh, then the uh, business you are actually selling your uh, <clears throat> your services too will have another uh, let's say 25% tax added to this uh, amount they, they actually pay. Now uh, the um, the why part is also really simple in this case. Uh, we, uh, we wanted to create a solutions, solution that has no bureaucracy involved and uh, if you generate enough income in a month, you can actually uh, receive health insurance from this as well. Now, uh, this might seem that, uh, or this might seem that it's quite impossible too, but actually it, it is really possible. It is, it's quite simple. Now, there, there, is, there is something beautiful in, in the simplicity, how it's actually done. Now. It is a free service to everyone. And uh, how, how it works is it's just a simple uh, bank account. You can open as, as many as you like. You can order a bank card to it. You can withdraw cash, you can add cash. You can also accept payments with if you order a car terminal to it. And uh, the, the key to it how it works is that every transaction that is added to this account, the tax collection or the ca tax calculation is done instantly and automatically in the background. And by that, it also is added to the uh, person's tax return. The calculation is done uh, on the tax and customs board side. Thus, it, it is always correct. And it is all online all the time. Um, uh, getting a um, a entrepreneur account is 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 really simple. All you have to do is uh, you have to have an account or let's say a user account in uh, in LHB uh, Bank. Then you log in. You open an entrepreneur account by simply agreeing to some terms, signing the agreement, and you're done. And you can start accepting payments, whatever you want. The uh, payments show up in your monthly, uh, or your account statement. First, there's the uh, proceed that come from your, uh, uh, from the, uh, whoever you're do doing business with, and also the uh, taxes that are uh, automatically calculated that are sent out to the tax and customs board. And that's it. There's nothing more difficult about it. Now, some of the uh, results from, uh, these are taken from July this year. And uh, mm, we have more than two and a half thousand active accounts, which is quite astonishing that this has been only uh, two years. 
or uh, one and a half year almost. Uh, there's like four million euros uh, have been uh, have gone through these uh, trans uh, entrepreneur accounts uh, with more than two thousand transactions per month. And uh, I think this is the best number. It's like eight hundred and twenty thousand euros in taxes that are received uh, via entrepreneur account. Uh, this is this is a really big number to uh, put it in perspective. Uh, let's say that this was actually this was not paid. It's like almost close to a million. And uh, I think this is a really really nice number. Um, some remarks. Uh, this would not have been possible if we didn't have excellent cooperation with the tax board. And also uh, the X road infrastructure that, that is the data layer between uh, different government organizations uh, in Estonia uh, is the key to this. It is suitable for uh, new business models like Bolt, Uber, uh, Volt, any other sharing uh, uh, vendors. And uh, and the, uh, one of the uh, 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 points is also that the Estonian Unemployment Insurance Fund actually uh, sends a lot of clients our way because uh, they there there are a lot of people who have either lost the jobs or or are still looking for something and uh, and this is a really simple yet efficient way to start if you if you are. You don't have to open a company. There's no bureaucracy involved. And um, I think that's it. It's really that simple. Uh, thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, next to showcase is Quentin Vascott, uh, Associate Partner at KPMG Luxembourg. He would tell us how to combine blockchain and VAT. Welcome, Quentin. Hi everyone, my name is Quentin Warscott and I'm an associate partner at KPMG in Luxembourg. I'm joined today by Said Firi, my fellow colleague and partner here at KPMG Luxembourg, to talk to you about VAT DLT. What is it, you might ask? Well, it is a concept created here at KPMG that aims to fight against cross-border VAT fraud within the EU. Every year, 50 billion euros goes missing due to VAT fraud and missing trader fraud in particular. That makes 100 euros every year for every EU citizen. How is this possible? Well, missing trader fraud happens when traders do not remit the VAT they receive from their customers to the tax authorities. But these customers request a tax deduction based on the invoices they hold for the goods or services provided to them, which leaves the tax authority with a loss. This fraud scheme is usually facilitated by the application of the rules for cross-border supplies and related exemptions. It also relies heavily on the shortcomings of the current VAT reporting and collection mechanism. Nowadays, there should be efficient solutions for preventing VAT fraud, and KPMG's VAT DLT is one potential application. Our VAT DLT concept, which my colleague said we'll go into more details on in a few moments, enables a secure collection of VAT by relying on blockchain technology. This technology will enable the collection of VAT in a decentralized way, making it fraud-proof. VAT DLT is currently in a theoretical phase, but a white paper has been prepared and shared with the EU Commission and the tax authorities in Luxembourg. There are still a few obstacles we need to conquer in order to see this technology come to fruition. For example, a modification to EU directives requiring the unanimity of all member states will probably be required to make effective use of such concepts on a cross-border basis. And now I give the floor to Said, who will go in more details about our concept. Thanks, Quentin. Hi, everyone. Let's get together to the heart of it. How does it work? You might have heard a lot about the blockchain and the distributed ledger technologies over the last few years. Indeed, there has been a lot of buzz around these topics. We strongly believe in the potential of this technology to fight VAT fraud. As it means benefits is to allow various parties to validate transactions in real time and later have access to this information. This is exactly what is needed at the EU level to end VAT fraud. We have designed 
VAT DLT as a way to promote a decentralized network where EU transactions will be registered using DLT to eradicate VAT frauds for goods and services. The network, a private blockchain network, will be composed of nodes shared by EU countries' national fiscal authorities. These nodes will store all B2B transactions carried out within the EU. In addition, the network will be combined with entities that will capture money flows from the seller that we call cash CCP. VAT amounts will be tokenized by this cash CCP and reflected on the blockchain network. These VAT counts will only be exchangeable against money held by the tax authorities by taxable persons having the right to claim that VAT back. Undertaking this tokenization will ensure that VAT is actually paid to the tax authorities and does not disappear via fraudulent company liquidation or more generally by the disappearance of the taxable person that collected the VAT on behalf of the authorities. The scope of transactions that could be included in the VAT DLT network will be limited to domestic and cross-border B2B transactions within the EU. I know that's a lot to take in and, of course, such a model will not emerge from a day to another. As we previously mentioned, it has many challenges. Other challenges may arise due to the type of transactions in scope, adaptation of current regulations and the governance around this platform and its performance. Still, we are optimistic that these challenges can be overcome with a strong willingness to end the VAT fraud. And now I will leave the conclusion to Kanta. Thank you, Said. For the first time, a concept leveraging on new technologies answers the challenges raised by VAT collection. Even though it's an ambitious project, we strongly believe that the benefits for EU citizens are so significant that it justifies the implementation effort. Thank you for your attention. And now let's have a look at the video showing concretely how this could work. VAT DLT, a new concept from KPMG. VAT DLT could put a stop to VAT fraud by making sure that all VAT due is paid. It would do this by using a platform on which transactions are validated using a distributed ledger, also called blockchain technology. It also means that it's more secure than any other type of platform. Let's see how a single transaction might look. The buyer, company B, is based in Belgium. It is purchasing 12 bicycles from a Spanish firm, company S. Both have already signed up to the platform. Once the companies have negotiated the terms of the deal, it's up to the seller to register the transaction on VAT DLT. After automatic compliance checks, the platform confirms the VAT to be paid and then lets the buyer know where to send the money. The buyer transfers the money for the bicycles, including VAT, to the cash clearer. The cash clearer then transforms the VAT into tokens called VAT coins, which are put into the seller's VAT account via a secure API. The VAT is temporarily blocked on the seller's VAT account, so fraud isn't possible. This part of the process is key. The seller gets the money for the bicycles minus VAT. Meanwhile, the VAT coins are sent from the seller's VAT account to the tax authority's VAT account, first in the country of the seller, then in the country of the buyer. Netting can take place at this time. After that, the VAT can be reclaimed by the buyer. After more automated compliance checks, if everything looks good, the system approves the refund on behalf of the tax authorities. ka -ching. Everyone's happy. This entire process currently takes months, sometimes years. With VAT DLT, it will be done in days. VAT DLT and VAT fraud using blockchain technology. VAT DLT, a new concept from KPMG. I would like to invite uh, the next speaker, Bertun Nitti, uh, who is the head of products at Bassware. His presentation is Global Leaders in e-invoicing, cloud-based invoice automation. Welcome. 
Thank you. It's uh, it's good to be here. Um, let's see again if I can also share my screen. All right, I guess it's visible. So, hey, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, as I said, my name is Perton, I'm the Chief Product Officer of Bassware. And uh, I'll take a, a bit more uh, holistic picture this time and, and briefly talk about Bassware, but then, then talk about the role of e invoicing in the economy and, and, and also a little bit how it relates to sort of tax collection when, when goods and services are, are sold. So very briefly about Bassware. Um, so what do we do? So we are in the business of automating, automating what we call the source to pay process. So everything starting from when the supplier is being searched for um, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, time when the payment is actually made for those services or goods that have been, have been sold. And we operate this pretty much globally. So we have uh, we have a global, what we call it, an open business network, which is a network where the buyers and suppliers can exchange not only invoices, but e-invoices um, and uh, purchase orders um, and, and other documents related to, to the transactions. And um, we, we operate, uh, or our, our solutions are used, let's, let's put it that way, in more than 175 countries. Um, and the network, so we have more than 2 million organizations that are actually connected to the network and doing business. And of course, uh, there's also a lot of um, cross-border business uh, conducted there. So it's, there's a lot, of course, within country, but there's a lot of cross-border business as well. So I already briefly mentioned this, but, but when often, you know, the focus is on invoicing on what happens there, because that's, of course, quite central. Um, to the, to the taxation um, and, and, and getting the taxes right. Uh, but what it's really important to understand is that for, especially for the larger corporations, how they view the world is that it's part of this larger process that really does start from, you know, going through your spend, understanding where you're spending money, understanding who you're doing business with, and then starting, starting the vendor selection, the procurement, and then ultimately ending up in the invoicing and, um, and, and payments. And what these large corporations are typically after is to actually automate and digitalize this entire process. Now, having said that, a, a very good place for them to start um, is actually the e-invoicing the e and the accounts payable automation that comes, comes after that. So there's a, there's a lot of benefits also for the companies in getting accurate data from their invoices to their systems so that they can fully automate the, the internal process when it comes to, to invoice handling. Basically, they don't need to employ so many people doing sort of manual tasks because they can just automate it with, um, with solutions. So then about e-invoicing and taxes and what we see in the market. So, so uh, there's a lot of governments across the globe now pushing for, for e-invoicing and uh, in a, in a simplistic manner, we see basically two different types of models that are being adopted. So either it's a it's sort of a post audit model where you need to be able to provide evidence after the fact. Um, uh, for example, have have taxes being paid. Um, in these cases, uh, there might be a, a push from the government for the uh, organizations to adopt e invoicing, uh, but there is typically a bit more freedom to choose you know, between different methods and formats of how you actually do it. Then on the other extreme, uh, there's the clearance model, which enforces more control, which has also been actually quite, quite widely uh, adopted um, in Europe, as, as well as then, especially in Latin America. And now the latest one, one adopting a similar model is, is India, which is going to start in, in October uh, this year. And there, basically, invoicing is made mandatory. Um, and then there is a basically a central, um, typically a government controlled infrastructure environment, which makes sure that for every invoice that is sent, either a copy of the invoice or at least sort of the most important data that's needed for taxation is actually always posted to the government portal. So this is a way basically to battle the, the shadow economy that, that uh, depending on the country is a, is a lesser or a bigger problem, but I guess there are no countries that are sort of exempt from, uh, from, from this issue. So tackling it with, with, with the basic 
means of whenever an invoice is sent, there needs to be a, a, a copy in a way um, in the government systems. And then when the buyer is paying that invoice, they need to check that has this actually been registered or is it sort of a rogue invoice that hasn't ever been registered with the, with the government. Um, when going through sort of how to set up the, the, the e-invoicing, and of course, in some cases, it's governments who are pushing it. Some cases, it's large businesses who are, who are just like forcefully pushing their suppliers to go to e-invoicing. But it's really important to understand that they are multiple different stakeholders involved, each have their own needs. Um, and in order to be successful, you know, the needs of these different kind of organizations should be really taken into account. So simplistically saying, like, what kind of policy should be adopted to, to promote adoption? Um, well, first of all, I think, you know, mandates, what we've seen in, in different countries is that, of course, whenever there is a government mandate, I mean, Clearly, of course, that pushes the, 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 the companies more towards the invoicing. But it's also crucial to have enough pull in the system, meaning that there's enough benefits for all the parties. Because in the worst case, what we've seen is that while there is electronic invoicing infrastructure set, set in place by the government and this posting of the invoice data works, there might still be a paper copy of that same invoice sent between the buyer and supplier, which to me doesn't make any sense you know, in, in, in this age anymore. Um, it's important to make it easy to adopt, and especially for smaller companies. Uh, they don't have a lot of IT budget typically, and they are already constrained from many different um, directions. So, so it's important that they can adopt these kind of solutions easily. If at all possible, it, it would be good to leverage sort of the existing technologies frameworks. I've mentioned Peppel there, which is the sort of uh, one of the most most growing ones right now but basically just saying that let's not reinvent the wheel there are you know plenty of different technologies frameworks and formats already already available to choose from um i said mandates are good but um, i i do believe in sort of open innovation and competition and if there's too much mandates then that doesn't really always always take place uh, and overall i would say that you know to promote the open ecosystems and interoperability so you know, there are many other companies who are in the same business as, as, as Basware and, and, for example, we have more than 200 interoperability partners, meaning that if, if their supplier wants to send an invoice to our buyer, that is possible. So to wrap it up, basically, um, uh, what Basware is doing, of course, we're, we're operating globally a, an, an, an e-invoicing service. Um, uh, uh, ensuring that our customers can be compliant also with the local legislation and the taxation rules. Um, a lot of things mentioned on this slide, so I won't read everything through. Um, but what I would like to mention is, is the ecosystem and, and interoperability. So, so in our solution set, we have uh, also uh, open APIs, also to promote sort of innovation, like along and and on top of the on top of the Basware platforms from um, you know, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger fintech companies. And, and we have an active partnering strategy we've, um, I think, announced over the past year, maybe six, seven, seven technology partnerships in, in this space. All right, that was all from my part. Thank you, Berto, for your presentation. Uh, once again, I would like to give a reminder for, for keeping an eye on the time uh, so that uh, we have enough uh, time slots for, for everyone. Uh, for the next presentation, I would like to invite a pair of the speakers uh, that will represent uh, both sides, the governmental and the business side working on one project. So it is Gintara Sarbutavichus, Project Administrator at State Tax Inspectorate under the Ministry of Finance of Lithuania, and Andrus Kekaris, Chief Operating Officer at NRD Companies. They will represent the new way to declare income, so-called Declaration Wizard. Welcome. So, hello, uh, we'll share our screen in a second. And uh, my name is Andrus Kekaris. And my name is Gintaras Arbutavichus. And we would like to present you the Declaration Wizard, a new way to declare income in Lithuania. Project owner and initiator, Lithuanian State Tax Inspector. 
create and project de developer and of the systems responsible responsible for all development and NFQ technologies responsible for design. Yeah, sorry, I'm catching up with the slides here. NFQ. And, and, oh. and six, uh, why we started this project? 16 years ago, in 2004, the electronic declaration system was launched in Lithuania. Accountants and ordinary taxpayers started to provide declarations electronically. It was a big innovation because there was no need to go to regional inspectorates with paper declarations and tax inspectorate didn't have to check such a large number of declarations, paper declarations. The process of submitting and verifying the law <coughs> declarations has been significantly accelerated. At the time, declarations were big, large, gray, complicated forms with many boxes in which information had to be entered. For many taxpayers, this was difficult, incomprehensible. They had to seek help from accountants and consultants. So as, as you see from the uh, slide of the presentation, the original solution that we had here in Lithuania actually mimicked the paper process. Uh, so you had to fill out uh, a form that looked essentially the same as it looked on paper. Uh, it, you know, you fill it out, it goes to the, uh, to the local office where either a machine or, or, or a system or program or a human being actually checks what you submit uh, and, and provides you feedback at some other later point in time. Um, so together with, uh, with our uh, partners, NFQ Technologies and, and uh, State Tax Inspectorate, what we did, we turned the concept around. Uh, instead of, of making the person uh, put the data in the form that either the system or the institution or the form would understand and, and, and welcome and accept it, uh, we made the system ask relevant questions and meaningful uh, questions based on certain life events uh, or what people did or, or what kind of income they received. Maybe they did some, they did some sort of sales, uh, you know, rented an apartment or, or were renting an apartment. Uh, so all, all, sorts of, all those sorts of questions were put into sort of uh, uh, an intricate matrix that would really guide you through the process and make you answer questions based on what you provided before and, and ask, ask for your input to enter amounts or maybe provide some other specific data. Uh, so what we were trying to achieve here, we're trying to simplify the process to make it more uh, user oriented and be driven by the user himself, not by the form, not by the system. Uh, all of the text were really transformed into something meaningful that actually means something to the person providing information. Uh, I, I know from my personal experience that every year that the tax, you know, filing uh, period come, come, used to come, I would really have to go back to my notes from the previous years to understand what kind of things go where into that specific form. So that was eliminated. We also eliminated, you know, the uh, this the sort of background check that used to happen in the background, either by a system or by a machine. All of that is now done in real time. Uh, you know, the wizard is something that the person sees, but there's so much more happening in the background. Um, a lot of cross checks, uh, a lot of information is being pulled from different institutions or different entities that are being held by the tax authority. And all of those are being cross checked and calculated in real time and feedback is provided in real time. So basically at the end of the process, the person is actually able to pay their taxes or see what the amount is being returned to them and actually get it in a few days time. One of the things that also was very uh, painful that we wanted to eliminate was multi, uh, or unavailability of multi-language support in the, in, the, in the old forms because they were really modeled by a paper form. Language was complex. It was really understandable mainly for the accountants not for, for, for lay people like you know, myself and every other uh, who just 
goes around their normal life. Also, another thing that was never really addressed by the forms was uh, visual impairments or people with visual impairments. Uh, they used to have to have help, uh, external help, uh, whether at the local tax office or, or a family member would do that for them. And needless to say, those forms never worked on mobile devices. They were created in 2004. Uh, and that's for all of us, you know, before the iPhone or before contemporary smartphones came in and, and tablets and mobile devices. So all of those things were addressed with the wizard that we actually developed this time around. Mm -hmm. And I will compare some statistical facts from last and this year declaration. 1.4 million declarations were filled last year and 1.66 million declaration filled this year. 260,000 declaration more. Last year, 80% of declarations were submitted by taxpayers themselves and 20% were submitted with the help of the consultants. This year, 87% themselves and 20 uh, and 13 with consultants, uh, seven percent more. Mm -hmm. Last year, and uh, yeah, yeah, very interesting number. Last year, filling of declaration took five or ten minutes approximately, and this year, from two minutes, five minutes and if if you know we look at the scale of things that we were actually able to achieve uh when you go from say an average of five minutes to you know to doing your tax returns once a year and we were able to to you know to make it even smaller to make you to bring it down to three minutes so even in with a modest count with 1.6 million people doing this every year we realized the time saving of about 84,000 man hours. That's about 41 man years. Uh, so you can imagine what, you know, the significance or the, sort of the power of big numbers here. Uh, so that's why we're really excited of what we're able to achieve this time. And we have received and still receive very good feedback on our visit from our taxpayers. And, and you know, we are proud of that. <laughs> this is the best evaluation of our work. Um, and obviously, there are various streams of, of, of reviews that are coming in from different parts of social media. You know, it's uh, a media portal Delphi that's popular here in the Baltics. Uh, you know, they, they did a survey about 71% respondents said that they were pretty happy with what they, they were able, you know, to, to do this year with uh, their tax returns. Uh, obviously not 100%, you know, people are really happy with this. And, uh, you know, having talked to a few of my friends and, and telling them that, yes, we were part of this big adventure. And I asked them, you know, why, why you were not really happy with this? Well, because I had to pay taxes in the end. So that's why probably, you know, the 29% of people are not happy with the solution we provided them. But otherwise, the reviews are really great. And, and obviously, the, the difference in time, how much you have to actually spend doing this uh, once a year and, and how, how much less complicated it is now, it's really overwhelming. And one last thing uh, to mention here in Lithuania, we have a, a competition that's called Noviesis Knignesis. And it's specifically aimed at, at seeking out and promoting and, and awarding innovative digital solutions that are bred and raised and, and, and expanded here in Lithuania. So we're very happy with our uh, personal income tax wizard. Uh, we were nominated for the best solution for Lithuania and, and we were the, the solution that was most appreciated by the, pub, by the public. So those were the two awards we actually received this year. So we're also very happy and very proud. So thank you very much for your presentation and congratulations on the award. 
Um, as a user of Declaration Wizard, I can admit uh, this year it was a painless experience, at least for myself. <laughs> and more people I've heard from spending a couple of hours that really shortened up to 10 or 20 minutes, still figure around the forms, but uh, congratulations on the results. Um, I would like to move on uh, with our panel discussion and to sum up and wrap it up what has been said and comment more on the whole uh, development process. Um, as Ginter has mentioned over the presentation, um, there is this uh, common belief that building technical solutions for the public sector is something extremely complicated, inflexible, very long term. Uh, so could you please comment how the whole experience of creating these solutions was for you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Ginter has Gintras is thinking that it's probably more a question to me, but I don't know. It was from from our point of view, you know, our company does really does a lot of work with the governments, government institutions, not just here in Lithuania, but abroad. But this one was really where, you know, the, the collaboration was really the key. Uh, it was really the state tax inspector that, uh, you know, came up with the understanding that things needed to change and they sought out a, a, a partner that would help them to, you know, to both guide through the change and help them understand what sort of things were really the pain points and what needed to be changed. And another partner we had with us was, was NFQ Technologies. We don't have them here today with us, but they were the ones that actually dove deep into the user experiences and creating this uh, a really comprehensive and painless user journey through the process that we were really able to implement here. What about others? Uh, Margus, could you share how, how the whole experience was for you? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think the, the word I'm actually looking for is painless. Uh, uh, the best part is that we, we actually split the uh, development in, into two separate processes. The tax part was done by the Tax and Customs Board and the Internet Bank part was done by us. This is both actually both for salary payment that Henry was talking about and the entrepreneur account. And, uh, and this made this really simple as, uh, as we both were able to actually leverage the, the knowledge we have and, and uh, focus on, on the user experience and whatnot on, uh, on, the, on the things that we actually know about. And, uh, and not, we didn't have to, uh, you know, start learning about everything about tax calculation and whatnot. And then the tax board just were able to put out these really nice uh, API endpoints through the X-Road uh, layer and uh, we were just able to use them and, uh, and create these, these nice services for everyone. Uh, Henry, I would look up to you as LHV Bank was mentioned a couple of times in Margaret's presentation and yours. So is it the same feeling on your end as well? Uh, well, um, for uh, tax administration side, uh, the complexity doesn't go anywhere. It's uh, still present here. So uh, actually uh, to build a simple solution on top of a complicated, uh, complex uh, system, it's, uh, it is quite difficult, but, uh, but to, get, uh, to get users to use it, then this is something that needs to be done. Uh, in some cases, for example, well, actually both uh, both developments were uh, quite uh, difficult and complex uh, complex on uh, tax administration side. Uh, but the output uh, uh, of uh, of the services that uh, the APIs that we created they needed to be a simple uh, solutions, simple to use, simple to implement for banks. Uh, otherwise, uh, it would not have gotten any traction from the bank side and uh, as was mentioned uh, by Andreas also that uh, we need to uh, build uh, uh, solutions uh, in the in the government side also that are uh, easy to use the user experience is better it will uh, uh, benefit uh, the governmental organizations in getting more tax returns, getting more tax revenue. Like Marcus said, we have had uh, a little bit under a million euros extra tax income 
uh, in Estonia as well. So it will benefit. It is difficult to do, uh, keeping in mind all the, uh, the, the small extra cases that, or the, the difficult cases that are still present, but uh, we have to give an option to fill in a simple declaration for the majority that don't have the complex uh, 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 incomes to declare, for example. So, yeah. And Bertu, how, how the experience was for you? Did you find it uh, very complicated or everything went as you thought that would be? Yeah, we, uh, well, we, we work with quite a number of governments uh, uh, across the globe, I would say, mostly definitely on the positive side. Uh, things do tend to go, go quite smoothly and they have really advanced and capable people on their side to assist in the, in the technical matters when it comes to, to the integrations. Um, perhaps the only thing what, which sometimes happens, of course it happens in businesses as well, is, is that the, the sort of the, the need uh, or which typically can come from, from, example, from a legislation change is, is pushed through in some cases quite fast and maybe there isn't always a perfect synchronization with the technological departments. So in some cases, the projects tend to be a bit, a bit rushed and then you, then you do need to sort of adapt along the way and, and, and keep on sort of having, having things under what I would call like a heavy maintenance because maybe the systems also on the government side are changing still and then everybody needs to adapt to that. But even those, I think, you know, we are you know, fairly well being able to cope with because uh, there is typically a very capable team then on the government side to, to ensure that everybody is in sync. Um, I would like to discuss with you, uh, what is a good starting point for FinTech solutions um, in public sector? Uh, because during today's uh, uh, presentations, we've heard a couple of examples. One is offering new innovative services uh, or either it's solving most common pain points. So at one point you get low hanging fruits and solutions um, that are used sometimes by the niche or this is something new and uh, more simply to integrate or like um, uh, Gintaras and Andrews discussed, they are remaking something that already exists in the market. So what's, what's the entry point uh, and uh, what's, uh, if, if you comment on that a bit. Margus, I would look at you as LHB Bank is uh, pretty known as a bank innovator in Estonia. So what's your approach? Taking something uh, that you can um, uh, do experiments with or uh, solving really deep problems uh, with the government organizations? I think this is, um, well, it, it's always a cooperation because uh, we cannot really solve everything without uh, the, the, the three key parts that is, uh, the, uh, well, us as a bank, uh, the tax and customs board in this case, and also the, uh, every other part of the government and uh, in, in essence, the legislation. And in some cases, well, uh, especially the entrepreneur account was that we were already in the process when, when the legislation was created and thus we were able to actually supply input already in that phase. And I think uh, uh, that can actually lead to a really or uh, a, a simpler and then the more user friendlier uh, process or, or uh, legislation in, in, in that case as well. It, and um, I think the, the key is to uh, look at this from the, the client's perspective, not trying to find out that, oh, we have to innovate on something, but actually think about things we can simplify or create completely new solutions. And um, well, I, um, I, I think yeah, the, uh, there's um, there's no 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 other more more uh, intricate I don't know difficulty behind it. Just look at uh, the problems you're currently having, pick one, and try to solve it. Is there anyone who would like to comment on uh, this particular question? Yeah, I can say my word that. Uh, uh, that is, we have to monitor all our services, what is the feedback, see uh, how much, uh, uh, how large is the audience that uh, this uh, one or the another service uh, uh, 
uh, influences and uh, make our own uh, logical decisions uh, to, I mean, we cannot, uh, govern, governmental organizations cannot uh, uh, make everything better for everyone at once. So we have to start from somewhere. We have to monitor all the services and uh, uh, start from, uh, from the, the parts that influence the most of uh, the bigger number of uh, people. So I, I think this is the most logical way to go. Also, of course, legislative changes uh, need to be done if, uh, if we are going uh, on with a more digital future uh, and we want to offer more digital services to, uh, to users. So I think this is uh, something uh, that uh, the lawmakers have to uh, cope with uh, while making laws. Uh, they have to uh, include uh, the developers in some, some way to, uh, to come up with the, with the right uh, wording for legislation as well. Yeah. Um, talking about uh, new laws and regulations, um, and when it comes to taxes, it seems that the main driving force for um, innovation is regulation, and solutions are developed when something becomes mandatory. Uh, let's talk what empowers innovation in your country sector, public sector the most. Is it really the regulation or uh, there could also be the country strategy like in Estonia's example? So I would like to hear uh, on your approach on that. Uh, in Estonia, it's, it's one and the other. Uh, there are both, uh, both ways. I mean, mostly it is, yes, uh, it comes from, from legislation uh, changes and then it goes to, uh, to the developers that we need to enforce this, uh, this change also in, uh, in our IT systems. Uh, in some cases, like, uh, let's say the, uh, well, actually we don't, we didn't do any uh, legislative changes in uh, salary payment, but we just uh, uh, made it work inside this uh, reg regulation that uh, is in force. But uh, as we go on, uh, I have been uh, involved in, uh, in the ministry level as well uh, as the development specialist to, to give guidance uh, in making new laws that, uh, that these laws that they enforce, they, they are actually doable in a, in a more or less uh, reasonable uh, development uh, cost, let's say. Bertu, what's your takeaway on that? Yeah, now I have to sort of speak almost as a Finnish citizen rather than a company representative. But uh, I, I, I think it's both. I mean, some, some things come via legislation and then, then in some examples, like the Finnish tax authority did, did decide on a, on a very big sort of a digitalization initiative many years ago already, which means that, I mean, I'm old enough to have filled in like these re very complex paper forms um, to file my personal taxes each year. And, and, and basically now how it works is that there is a, uh, there's a portal where I can go as a citizen. I can post and update sort of the taxation information along the way. Most of the information is coming there directly via the, via the connections that, that they have to the banks and to my employers. I don't actually, I actually get a pre-filled tax report every year which typically I don't even have to touch that much. Uh, and if I do, I do it on the portal rather than on, on, on sort of complex paper forms. So, so I think a lot can be also achieved, not via legislation, uh, but just by having a very strong digitalization agenda. Um, of course, in some cases, the legislation can even work against this. So, so, so sometimes you have to go through the legislation to make sure that you actually can do these things. Uh, and especially now with more machine learning and, and artificial intelligence coming into the picture, there's a big discussion now that, you know, what, for example, what kind of decision making can you do by that versus with, with a human being? And, and how do you take that into account in the legislation? So I think there's a, off to a good start, I would say, in, in, in I guess, all the countries that are represented here, but, but uh, certainly there's still more things to do. Yeah, thank you. Andres and Gintras, I'm sure you would have something to add on as you've been already working on, on the project like this. So was it additional boost and motivator for you or a pressure at the same time? Um, for us, it was definitely a, 
a, a motivator because you know I can definitely say for the whole team or the extended team, everybody has has been using you know the old forms, and it was really exciting to to see how we can break down silos that were built between either you know different organizations within the country or different government institutions and and how they work with sharing data or even how you know silos were built around and how we help to maybe overcome those within different systems at the same institution and organization to make sure that you know all of the everything that is available to sort of to the broader government can be integrated and can be exploited to make you know the the user journey a bit more or more pleasurable than, than it was before. Because I think it really comes down to the mindset of how you want to approach it. There's two, two extreme ways, you know, whether you work for your organization, your institution, or you work for the, for the client, for the citizen, for the, I don't know, for the business that would use your services. But there's always this, you know, area in between where you can actually make, make sure or, or or bring a lot of benefits to both parties where it's, it's both easy and easy to comply. The barriers are really low um, uh, to comply with the law, to, you know, to, to perform your sort of legal duties as a, as a taxpayer, as a business, and also the, the technological or, or administrative burden to the institution is actually lowered through the technological means. So it's, I think it really comes down to, to, to mindset. Uh, so could all of you share what were the key challenges uh, for the development and implementation of these solutions? Uh, you mentioned mentality, but um, at one point it could also be financial, legal, uh, technological, or even regulatory issues. So it would be really nice to hear some uh, uh, real examples from you. I can maybe chime in here. Uh, Actually, I think the biggest challenge for at least for the entrepreneur account was that um, even though the the legislation was already in effect, uh, we had the um, well, uh, we were pretty much ready to start developing it, but um, as uh, there were too many different things already in. Uh, in both the, the tax uh, board's pipeline and our pipeline. So we actually took one year to get this project actually developed on uh, off the ground. So I think that was probably the, the biggest hurdle uh, we, we had to overcome. Just we had to wait uh, one year to, to get this thing uh, out to the public. But other than that, uh, from our side, there, there wasn't any, anything really that, that difficult to overcome i think uh, of course the the uh, taxation part is uh, monumentally more more complex uh, and and that's why it's probably um understating their efforts in this case but but yeah i think that that we we didn't have any any big problems in in either either side or either project project i mean Okay, maybe uh, I can add on to this, uh, the uh, tax administration side of, uh, for example, the entrepreneurship account. Um, like uh, Berto mentioned that uh, the, the governmental databases should work together to uh, share data. So uh, we in Estonia as well have this uh, similar mindset that uh, you should uh, ask data from, uh, from uh, a person once and uh, then uh, different governmental organizations uh, exchange the data to, to everyone gets it uh, who needs it. But uh, uh, the government, all the data that uh, you give to your government is uh, quite sensitive. So uh, the, all the databases, they are regulated, they, they have their own set of rules and uh, each time you change something, you have to change the the contracts, the, the legislation and so on. So with the entrepreneurship account as well, it wasn't difficult to calculate tax to create these uh, services that, uh, that communicate, communicate between bank and uh, tax administration. But, uh, but uh, so many different uh, institutions or uh, organizations in Estonia need this, the same data or the data that uh, that you that we calculate from uh, from the 
from the income that you get. For example, if you get a thousand euros, then 20% goes to tax. This tax divides between income tax, social tax, pension fund, uh, social tax uh, information has to go to different organizations. So uh, by creating this, uh, this one service to uh, bank, we had to change 20 services that uh, communicate between different other uh, governmental organizations. Uh, and also this mean, meant uh, also creating those new contracts between all the organizations and so on. So it, it is difficult, but it, it's doable. So, yeah. I'll jump in if, if I may, and I'll tack to one of the previous Henry's comments where he said that, you know, he had been invited to some discussions with the lawmakers when producing or, or advising on, on how to word the law so that they're easier implementable in, in systems or in software. So in our project, our biggest challenge was to actually parse down the, the tax law or the tax code into something that uh, would essentially present a linear journey to the, uh, to the taxpayer, but would guide him through all of the, you know, if you remember the, this paper form, we essentially had to guide him with a linear journey through every field and have every field filled. And, and that's, a, that's really a challenge because, you know, you have to understand what sort of questions you need to ask to get the right information and where the answer you get at a particular point in time will have to guide you next in order to make sure that you get all of the information. So this was the biggest challenge, but I would strongly, you know, agree with Henry with his also last comment that he said, you know, you have to come up, come with a certain mindset when you design laws, you design tax codes or any kind of other legislation that would be meaningfully presentable and implementable in systems to both make the, the life of the institution easier and the, the journey of the customer or the taxpayer also easier. Pertu, any challenges on your side? Yeah, I think the challenges mostly come from uh, from the fact that we operate globally. So, so we operate with with many many different governments across the board, and uh, and just keeping up with um, with the changes because there's always you know a little bit of changes either in the technical interfaces or or, or just in the legislation, um, and then to just keep up with that and and understand and know you know what's happening where and and have that information like. Uh, well enough in advance. I'd say that that's maybe the biggest uh, biggest struggle for us. Other than that, I think it's it, it is going pretty smoothly. Uh, my next question uh, would go for for the development companies, for the change makers in public sector. So, how is it different working with uh, governmental organizations versus B two B clients? Uh, isn't there room for startups or you need to, to have strong muscles uh, to go into this collaboration? Andrews, yes, that, I'll, that I'll, sounds I'll, a lot from your side. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into this one. Uh, I have to admit right off the bat, our, our company does not work with uh, business customers. I, I mean, within the, our broader group, we do have a few companies that do B, uh, B2B, but we essentially focus on the governmental solutions and governmental systems. But yes, you have to have thick skin. You have to have a lot of muscles because, you know, government institutions, they're, they're big, you know, they're, 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 sometimes they're complicated, but you have to understand the reality they deal with. They have, you know, a lot of legislation they have to deal with. They have a lot of legislation that they have to implement and oversee. Uh, so naturally, their systems are complex, the processes are really not uh, easily comprehensible, and, and you have to invest both time and effort to, to get up to speed and to both, uh, you know, help your client and, and make sure you guide your team through the right journey and to get to the required results. So yes, you have to have stamina, you have to have perseverance, and you have to put in a lot of effort to get, you know, the right result that, that would be also satisfy, satisfiable you know, to use and, and, and really meaningful to actually bring change. Petr, do you share a similar experience? Yeah, I mean, in addition to, to just uh, to, to connect to these government run, run, run sort of portals, we also, of course, sell and offer our services to, to, to various governments. 
Um, and I do agree. I mean, it does does require a bit of bit of muscle and and, and thick skin for for the reasons that uh, Andrew explained earlier. Um, I, I would say that of course it also depends on the government, but I, I would say that may, maybe as a guideline, if they want to allow also smaller companies to to do business with them, is is that uh, in some cases we've seen that there's a very very long list of mandatory requirements. Uh, in order to participate in a bid, for example, and with a closer scrutiny, actually, they don't always come from any kind of legislation or, or like real need. It, it's, it, it may be something that was actually required ages and ages ago. It, it can come, come back from like some templates which were used back in the days when you everybody hosted their own service and such. So, so maybe just a, a request that um, keep in mind when they're building these RFIs and RFPs that they don't sort of unnecessarily block out smaller smaller companies by introducing requirements that are not truly must have. I can maybe add to this only from my side, the fact that we've uh, actually done business both uh, implementing with the government, with the, the taxation board and uh, with TransferWise. And uh, I think the, the uh, while uh, you mentioned this, that uh, there are some slower processes or, or maybe more difficult processes, in some cases, this actually can be quite good because with the governments, let's say the, the API we're actually tying into, it is, uh, it, it, it's rather strict in a sense that it, it will not change while you're working with startups, they might, you know, come up with a really great idea next day and change everything and everything breaks. So there are like two, two sides to this thing always. And, uh, and, but, but this doesn't really mean that it, one is better than the other. It's just one little fun fact that, uh, that we, we've, we've had uh, experiences working with both. And, uh, and uh, I must say that there, at least for the Estonian government, everything works really well, and uh, and uh, people actually want to do these solutions and, and uh, make life better for the for the customer or for the citizen. I can uh, I can maybe comment on on my side that uh, I've seen what are some of the I think the biggest issue uh, for uh, development companies that we work with uh, is the, that they have to. Uh, work uh, to develop a software that uh, considers all the all the cases, every small little detail that that needs to be that that can happen, uh, but uh, they don't have access to real world data. So this is a, a very difficult task to do if uh, you are not allowed to see what is actually the data in governmental databases. So. But uh, this is something that's a challenge for, for development companies, yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing. That was uh, really interesting to hear. And as uh, for the whole time we spoke about what has been achieved already, what were your case studies and, um, and success stories at the same time, I would like to hear from all of you uh, on my last question. So what's the next biggest thing uh, in your agenda? In, in relation to impact, fintech, uh, or innovation making? That's a tough one, uh, but you have one shot. Uh, okay. Um, currently, I'm working uh, on a project that's uh, actually um, uh, connecting uh, different government, uh, very different governmental databases with very different uh, level of uh, data that's uh, how correct it is some databases that uh, are quite poorly uh, poor data quality and uh, the others are quite good so the difficulty is here to uh, to get all this data to uh, make it connect with each other with uh, each other and uh, then actually give a result that is acceptable. So this is uh, something that's my task currently and uh, it is quite difficult, uh, I can say. Good luck with that. Uh, who would like to go next? I might take a stab at this. Um, I can't really mention anything specific, 
because otherwise we might lose the uh, the edge of actually going public with something. Uh, we are working on multiple solutions that uh, would would we would like to make or make life uh, easier for for our customers. Unfortunately, none of these are actually uh, tied to any government things at the moment, but but we we are always working on on something. So, unfortunately, I cannot name any specifics. So. Maybe on the next event you could share the updates uh, on, you know, current achievements. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, Andres, what about you? I'll let Gintara start first. <laughs> you know, we have 100 different declarations and uh, our biggest challenge in future to create other declaration results. <laughs> for those declarations. Yeah, so it's that, that's definitely a complex task. Uh, as for our companies, uh, what we're actually looking forward to uh, is, is uh, one specific thing is, is virtual fiscal devices uh, or virtual cash registers. And there has been some, uh, some movement on this in Lithuania, I think during the last year, but we are, we're also working on a solution in one of the foreign or countries outside Lithuania and actually building this uh, for that country. So uh, I think in a few short months time, we'll probably be able to come back and tell you how, how that went. Uh, Berto, is there anything specific you would like to share about? It's a pretty broad topic. I mean, we will continue on the agenda of, of helping both businesses and governments to digitalize this, this sort of uh, uh, purchase to pay or source to pay process and of course the invoices and the and the and the suppliers are are key there so there's still a tremendous amount of paper-based or image-based invoicing going on and answering like even simple questions that you know for all of your spend like so so how much do you spend who do you spend it with and what do you spend it on to get that from a single place uh, with clean data, and then to be able to offer that data also via APIs to, to, to of course, the customers themselves and with their consent to, to sort of innovative third parties. I think there's still a lot of work to do there. So that's what we'll be doing also in the future. Uh, thank you very much. So I believe that was a nice wrap up and uh, something to wait in the future. Uh, so from my side, I would like to thank for all the panelists and for uh, presentations that we're giving today uh, that really helped us to give a better understanding uh, how fintech and govtech collaboration could look like, especially in relation to taxes. Uh, so for the viewers, I wish um, have, uh, have a nice day and enjoy the rest of the govtech week. Goodbye.